Well, um, welcome everybody to um, another event, another iteration of the University of Manitoba Center for Human Rights Research Critical Conversations Series. Um, my name is Adele Perry and I am coming to you um, well, not very far away from the Red River, from the territories of the Anishinaabe in a new and Métis people governed by the promises of Treaty 1, where we still have a great deal of snow and it is still winter. Um, but where we are grateful to, uh, to be here and to live um, in these lands and amongst these histories. Um, for a long time, the Critical Conversation Series provided a way to combine a senior level seminar um, with one open to a wider community in person that used to actually come in person to hear talks at the University of Manitoba. We've kept the spirit and the intent of this format, but like so much um, that has happened in the last few years, we've moved it online. And in a time of, of such regular and persistent loss, um, this has been a real unexpected joy to be able to connect with thinkers and actors from beyond our territory and welcome a wider community to that conversation. This year, our focus is on how histor historians and public history professionals and uh, folks associated with both of those groups have addressed or failed to address a wide range of historical events and processes that might be considered under the very broad tent of human rights violations or atrocities within the context of Canada and the territories that preceded it. How have scholars, researchers, and public history people addressed a historical record and a present that includes, amongst other things, slavery, dispossession, incarceration and internment, forced removal, racialized laws and policies, including around migration, healthcare, purges of queer people? How have languages of human rights that have circulated so widely since the post-war era helped or alternately not helped to understand and engage these histories? What are the limits and the possibilities of the frameworks of human rights and indigenous rights for accounting for and engaging with a range of these difficult histories in the Canadian context? Um, today, we are honored to be joined by Dr. Renisa Mawani, who is a professor of sociology at the University of British Columbia, where she is also an associate of the Social Justice Institute and the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies. Dr. Mawani researches at the interface of critical theory and legal history, and increasingly at the juncture of science, law, and history, examining how colonial claims to wilderness and nature work to consolidate colonial control and dispossess indigenous people. Her 2009 book, Colonial Proximities, examined the legal encounters between indigenous peoples and racialized migrants in 19th and 20th century British Columbia. Today, we are going to hear about and from and around uh, Dr. Mawani's prize-winning 2018 book, Across Oceans of Law, The Komagatamaru and Jurisdiction in the Time of Empire. This is an elegant and important piece of scholarship, one that has a range of implications for how we see modern Canada and its relationship to the world and to colonialism writ large. Um, we are very much honored to have Dr. Mawani with us. I'll let you know that we are recording. Um, the plan is that, that uh, Dr. Mawani will speak for about 30 minutes or so and we'll then take questions. So I will turn things over uh, to Dr. Mawani, who we are so grateful to have you with us. Thank you so much, uh, Adele, for inviting me and for uh, the introduction. Um, and before I begin, I would, of course, like to acknowledge that UBC is located on the unceded territories of the Musqueam people. Uh, and I'm speaking today from my home, which is on the unceded territories of the Squamish people. And I thank them both uh, and the Tsleil-Waututh for their hospitality under conditions not of their own choosing. Um, so my talk this afternoon draws from the second chapter of Across Oceans of Law, and I'm just going to try sharing my screen. Good. Okay. Um, so this is the cover of the book. Um, uh, and I'm going to speak from the second chapter, which is titled uh, The Ship as Legal Person. So just to give you some context, the book retells the well-known voyage of the British-built and Japanese-owned steamship, the SS Komagatamaru, 
which of course is featured on uh, the cover of the book. Uh, drawing from what I call oceans as method, I follow this ship through time and space across the Pacific and Indian oceans um, and away from narratives of immigration, landfall and sovereignty. I use the well-known voyage to think about the relationships uh, between different histories and geographies of transatlantic slavery, indigenous dispossession, and forced migration. And in some ways, this requires a history uh, not only of the passengers, but also of the ship uh, and of maritime documents, which is the focus of my talk today. Um, So Baba Gurdit Singh, a railway contractor and planter who lived in Malaya and Singapore um, and in Surrenda before he chartered the Kamagatamaru, uh, actually chartered the vessel in 1914. Um, sorry, I'm just checking the chat to make sure it's not directed at me. Uh, the ship left Hong Kong on April 4th, stopped first in Shanghai and then in Moji and Yokohama to pick up additional passengers before making its Trans-Pacific voyage to Vancouver. Uh, the vessel arrived on May 23rd, carrying 376 passengers from Punjab. Most were Sikh, 12 were Hindu, and 25 were Muslim. All were young men, except for two women and three children, including Gurdit Singh's uh, six-year-old son, Balwant. Spending six weeks at sea, only 20 people were allowed to land. The remaining passengers were denied entry under three orders in council, the most egregious of which was the continuous journey regulation, which required all migrants to Canada to make a direct voyage from their place of birth or naturalization. And as you can see from this map here, uh, the Kamadachimuru did not make a continuous journey. So thanks to the work of scholars, artists, and activists in Canada, the US, and India, the Kamagatamu has become iconic, inspiring new scholarship and creative practice, including theater productions, visual art, and poetry. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Simon Fraser University's uh, wonderful website in which many uh, of the documents around the Komagatamaru, mostly from uh, Library and Archives Canada, but also from uh, the city and the Vancouver Public Library, have been digitized and are made available to researchers. So the scholarship on the Komagatamaru is now voluminous and rapidly expanding. Yet the steamer's journey primar has primarily been narrated through the coordinates of arrival, departure, nationalism, and territoriality, themes that center histories of immigration as histories of landfall and entry. But as this map shows, the ship crossed the Pacific and Indian Oceans, passengers spent six months at sea, and were confined to a vessel that was overcrowded and filthy. Upon their arrival to Vancouver, passengers reported overflowing toilets, decks that were infested with rats and flies, a lack of food and clean water. Yet somewhat surprisingly, few scholars have considered the ship and its transoceanic itineraries or the colonial and racial histories that maritime worlds engendered. The Komagatamaru was chartered by a man who was familiar uh, with land, who was a railway contractor and a and a planter, and who wanted to challenge uh, the dominion of Canada and the British Empire from the sea. So ac Across Oceans of Law, as uh, the title suggests, situates the Kamagatamaru's journey within oceans and maritime worlds. My move from land to sea, from immigration um, law to maritime regulations, is an an effort to trace the circulations of law and Indian radicalism and to invite other ways of writing global legal history. So by following this one ship through time and space, uh, and you can see it's uh, many voyages on this map, I foreground its actual routes along the Pacific and Indian Oceans, the connections it forged with the Atlantic and the legal and political effects it had in the British Empire and beyond. When viewed from the sea, the Komagatamaru's journey appears as much more than a national immigration history. It becomes a global event that joined Indian migration to other histories of British imperial rule. So the book uh, approaches the territorial dispossession of indigenous peoples uh, on Turtle Island, transatlantic slavery, Chinese and Indian indenture, and so-called free migration as overlapping forms of racial and colonial violence that were connected by shared legal forms. And 
the shared legal form that I'm really sort of concentrating on is the ship itself. So today, my, fo uh, my focus will center on the Atlantic Ocean, an ocean that the Komagachimaru never crossed in, a, in its 1914 voyage, but which loomed large nonetheless. I trace the links between transatlantic slavery and Indian migration in several ways, through the legal personhood of the ship and the legal personhood of the slave, through maritime documents of credit and debt, and through languages of freedom and unfreedom that informed the anti-colonial critiques made by passengers aboard the ship. And I'll just sort of highlight some key points today. In the Komagachmaru's uh, 1914 passage, several passengers drew selectively from histories of transatlantic slavery to challenge what they believed to be the inhumanity of British law. Methodologically, what I'm suggesting is that maritime worlds help to foreground connections across time and space that may be unforeseen, unexpected, and overlooked when Indian migration is studied from land alone. So before I turn to the Atlantic slavery and the legal personhood of the ship, I need to make a brief detour to the Komagatamaru's many lives. And what I hope to show you is how histories of dispossession, forced movements, and exclusion are evidenced in the ships that crossed that crisscrossed ocean regions. So this takes us to ships and shipbuilding. In 1890, Charles Connell and Company, a mid-sized firm located on Glasgow's Clyde River, built the steamer that would come to be known as the Komagachimaru. Initially identified as Ship 168, which you can see at the top of the, um, the slide here, the passenger cargo vessel was commissioned by the Hansa Line to transport European travelers from Hamburg to Antwerp and across the Atlantic to Montreal, where many settled, changing relationships to land and furthering the dispossession of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg peoples. The ship, which was named the Steubenhawk, also carried Canadian cattle from Montreal to British ports of call, including Thames and Dundee. And here is an advertisement uh, of the Steubenhawk carrying uh, and its capacity to carry cattle. In 1892, the vessel was sold to the, America Hamburg, the Hamburg America Line and two years later it was renamed the Cecilia. Under its new owners, the steamer continued to collect passengers from Hamburg and other German port uh, and northern port cities. And for the next decade, the Hamburg America Line expanded its routes to include um, Southern Europe and the Mediterranean. So passengers aboard the Sicilia came from port cities in Italy, Greece, Algeria, Spain, and Turkey, uh, and took travelers, the ship took travelers to Montreal, Boston, New Orleans, and Ellis Island, landing in many of the ports that former slave ships arrived in. Ships were vital to Europe's racial, political, and economic dominance of the globe, and this is evident in Connell's fleet. Connell's ships transported labor and commodities, including Indian indentures, cattle, and sugar, but they also carried settlers. Under its different owners and names, the Steubenhook and Cecilia were directly implicated in the dispossession of Indigenous people and in the resettlement of land, as I've already mentioned, uh, in the case of the Steubenhook. But in the case of Cecilia, between 1894 and 1913, the ship made 62 trips to Ellis Island, transporting over 40,000 people from the so-called Old World to the New, uh, and participating in the deterritorialization of the Algonquin-speaking Lenape people. And here is a manifest of one of the uh, one voyage from Genoa to Ellis Island. In 1913, the vessel was sold to a small Japanese firm and renamed the Komagat the Komakata Maru, uh, which is uh, named after the Asuka, Asakusa district in Tokyo. But due to a translation error, the ship would become uh, called the Komagata Maru, as it's listed here in the Lloyd's Shipping Registry. And although there is no formal name change, the vessel was listed in Lloyd's Registry accordingly. In 1924, the ship was sold for the last time and renamed the Hainan Maru and was shipwrecked off the coast of Hokkaido in 1925. So the map which I put up, um, oh, 
I must have taken it out. The map that I put up um, already shows the ship's voyages from 1890 to 1917, uh, which all came from Lloyd's shipping registry and gives you a sense of uh, the vessel's many travels. Oh, that's too far back. Okay. When we think of oceans, law is not the first thing that comes to mind. To some potential readers, the title of the book, Across Oceans of Law, may seem misguided, but the sea does have a legal history. One produced by indigenous seafarers, um, subaltern travelers, and uh, black mariners who crossed ocean regions. In the European imagination, the sea was conceptualized at different historical moments as vast, empty, and out of bounds. Oceans, especially the high seas, were beyond terrestrial borders and national claims. The sea was a place, but not one that could be owned and occupied. So for Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius, the sea was both immense and infinite. It manifested an ethereal quality that rendered it to be closer to air than to land. Although Grotius famously declared the sea to be free, this freedom was a freedom for European commerce and not a freedom from law. In his 1609 book, Mary Liberum or Free Sea, Grotius recognized that movements of European ships produced multiple and competing jurisdic jurisdictional claims. The sea could be owned, but it could not, uh, could not be owned, but it could be dominated through the maritime presence uh, of imperial powers. The sea has long been a site of legal order and legal contest through international treaties and agreements. But for Grotius, the movements of fit ships forged an equally important site of law, one that traveled along sea routes and connected disparate parts of the globe. Grotius's myth of the free sea became the basis of an international legal order that erased the legal relations and practices of indigenous black and Asian seafarers. For Lauren Benton, uh, ships were islands of law with their own regulations and juridical personnel, the captain and including the captain and representatives of municipal legal authorities. Though a legal historian of the early Atlantic and of slavery, Benton does not consider how transatlantic slavery was implicated and even foundational to the law of the ship and the law of the sea. Legal histories of the sea and of maritime mobility, including so-called free Indian migration, are deeply connected to histories of transatlantic slavery. The status of the ship offered a legal form from which the status of the state, uh, which was deeply implicated with the legal status of the slave as a, uh, a legal non-person. So by now, some of you may have questions. What could transatlantic slavery, a trade formally abolished by British and American jurists in 1807 and in the British colonies in 1833 have to do with a merchant ship that crossed the Pacific and Indian oceans in 1914, carrying 376 Punjabi migrants. Long after abolition, uh, I argue in the book, histories of slavery continue to shape maritime worlds in established sea routes and itineraries through the status of ships as legal persons, in the legal regulation of Indian indentures and free Indian migrants, and in the violence of the Middle Passage. Echoes of slavery are palpable in the Komagatamaru's voyage. And in the remainder of my time, I'll turn first to the legal status of the ship and its relations to the legal status of the slave. And then I'll turn, I'll return to the Komagatamaru's passage and to the ghosts of transatlantic slavery as evidenced in ship for documents produced by Gurdit Singh and in the critiques made by passengers uh, aboard the ship. So in British and Anglo maritime cultures, ships have long been regarded as persons and legal persons respectively. For seafarers, ships were never an inanimate objects, they were living and willful beings. It was common for captains and crews to describe their vessels as having ship sense, an intuition through which ships could know and navigate the sea. It was seriously believed, remarked one source, that an old Western ocean traveler could find her way from the Mersey River in Liverpool to her own pier in New York without a man's help. A ship's sense, many captains and sailors claimed, was enhanced or inhab inhibited by temperament and personality. Some seafarers described their ships to be spirited, fiery, subdued, or obstinate, or obedient. 
Vessels had husbands and sisters. They were made lively through heteronormative and familial relations. And the Steubenhook sistership was the Grimm. Ships were animated by customs of the sea, but it was through the British common law and British and US admiralty law that they were given a legal status. In Britain and later the US, a ship was only a ship when its hull was fully complete. A ship within the meaning of admiralty is anything which is intended for navigation, Justice Brown from the US Supreme Court wrote. A boat in an unfinished condition, such as this, or one wholly unfit for navigation is not a ship within the meaning of admiralty. In 1902, building on the legal decisions of his predecessors, Justice Brown defined a ship as follows. He wrote, a ship is born when she is launched and lives so long as her identity is preserved. Prior to her launching, she is a mere congeries of wood and iron, an ordinary piece of property, as distinctly a land structure as a house. By anthropomorphizing the ship as a feminine figure, Brown signaled two key moments in her metamorphosis. The first was the baptism or launching in which, in which a ship receives her name. The second was the moment her keel touches the water. As the vessel was launched down river, she was magically transformed from an inanimate thing into a subject of admiralty jurisdiction. A ship legally defined, uh, Brown continued, acquires a personality of her own, she becomes competent to contract and is individually liable for her own obligations for which she may sue in the name of owners and be, sue in her own, and be sued in her own name. The legal life that American jurists ascribed to ships marked a radical departure from British admiralty law. As vessel personification became a legal fiction in the US, its status as legal person declined in, the, in Britain. However, the anthropomorphized ship retained its continuity with British legal thought through the law of Diodand, a legal concept that was derived from the common law and also provided a shape to the slave's status as legal person. So what I'm suggesting is that the ship and the slave are connected through admiralty law and the law of Diodan, which is also linked, uh, which also linked the US uh, and to Britain and medieval to modern legalities. Under the British common law of Diodand, a ship was viewed as a legal person. Derived from the Latin diodandum, meaning that which must be given to God, a diodand was any uh, chattel property that caused the death of an adult human. It was described as an accursed thing that was to be forfeited to God whose earthly representative was the sovereign. Under the common law, uh, Inanimate and animate non-human entities such as animals, knives, carts, locomotives, ships, uh, and slaves were given a life that could be taken away by the crown. Non-human animals and objects could be arrested, condemned, and forced to forfeiture. As the 19th century progressed and with the growing power exercised by railroad companies and the growing number of accidents, Diodand was described to be the remnant of a barbarous and absurd law that was unreasonable and inconvenient in the current age. It was abolished in 1846. But the abolition of Diodan, like the abolition of slavery, did not mark its demise or disappearance. In admiralty law, Diodan persisted as a recurring legal form that shifted between human and non-human and connected ship and slave in the interests of maritime commerce and in efforts to extend Anglo-legal jurisdiction across the high sea. So the law of Diodan was never formally adopted in Britain's colonies but many of its fiercest critics were American commentators. Um, in a 1906 article published in the San Francisco Call, Diodand was described to American readers as an ancient law. The article turned to William Blackstone's commentary on the laws of England. Any personal chattel that is the immediate occasion of the death of any reasonable creature, Blackstone wrote, is to be forfeited to the king to be applied to pious uses and distributed in alms by his highest almoner. The Diodand was in many ways a replica of, bib of biblical laws. Though Diodand removed legal liability from the owner and placed it in the animal or thing, the proprietor remained responsible for the actions of his property and was punished through forfeiture, indirectly through for forfeiture. The cost of Diodand was not determined by the worth of life lost, but by the value of that particular object that caused death, be it a sword, an ox, or a slave. The Diodan transformed the inanimate thing into a legal person and a financial value. 
As Britain became a maritime empire, this mode of calculating would be crucial to shipping and to transatlantic slavery, as demonstrated in developments by developments in maritime insurance, for example. So as a common law form, the Diodan held no jurisdiction on, on the sea. According to Blackstone, ships could be Diodan, but only under specific conditions. So no Diodans, he wrote, are due for accidental happening on the high seas, as oceans were beyond the jurisdiction of the common law. It wasn't uh, until 100 years later that American jurist and Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. would argue that the Diodan traveled from Britain via the common law across the Atlantic only to become foundational to US admiralty law. So in his famous book, The Common Law, Holmes described Diodan as a medical law, as a medieval law that drew on metaphysics to enact the liability of inanimate things. Though the Diodan had been abolished for 35 years, he noted its ongoing presence in American jurisprudence. For Holmes, the most striking example of Diodan was the ship. The ship is the most living of inanimate things. He wrote, servants sometimes say she of a clock, but everyone gives a gender to vessels. And we, must, and we need not be surprised to find a mode of dealing which has shown such extraordinary vitality in the criminal law applied with even more striking thoroughness in the admiralty. Also citing Blackstone's commentaries, Holmes reiterated that the ship on the high seas could not be considered diodand. But under admiralty law, a vessel was deemed a legal person, animated in much the same way as knives, horses, trains, and slaves. The legal personification of ships in US admiralty law drew on the common law of Diodand. It is only supposing that the ship uh, have been treated as if endowed with personality, Holmes insisted, that the arbitrary seeming peculiarities of the maritime law can be made intelligible, and on that supposition, they at once become consistent and logical. For others on the US Supreme Court, including Chief Justice John Marshall, who was of course the infamous author of the Marshall Trilogy, the legal personhood of ships was practical and political. It granted American jurists a necessary mechanism through which to extend their authority across the sea, especially in a period of thriving Atlantic commerce. Ideas of legal personhood, um, and their political, economic, and racial effects were perhaps no more, no more evident than nowhere more evident than in transatlantic slavery. As the law could grant life to animate objects through legal personhood, it could transform persons into things. At the same historical moment that British and US admiralty law granted ships a legal personality, the law of the sea deprived African captives their humanity. Keep in mind that the high points of the British and US slave trade were the 18th and 19th centuries respectively. The laws of slavery were more concerned with protecting the rights of, of slave owners than with establishing the political and legal status of slaves. However, questions of legal personhood emerged at two key moments, when African captives were transported as cargo and when slaves were accused of committing crimes on land or at sea. Just as the British common law and British US admiralty law distinguished the injuring ship from its proprietor, the laws of slavery differentiated the offending slave from her owner. This was not an equivalent or parallel process. If the legal personhood of ships emerged from maritime metaphysics, when the hull touches the water, the transformation of a slave from person to property followed a very different set of logics that authorized various forms and intensities of racial violence. Admiralty law and the laws of slavery transformed African captives first from humans to objects and then from car uh, cargo to legal persons. Whereas a ship's owner could be punished for the lawless actions of his vessel through its arrest and forfeiture, a slave owner was compensated for the death of his guilty slaves. The transformation of the slave from human to thing was neither dependent on metaphysics nor on abstraction alone. It demanded forms of racial and colonial violence. Under British and US admiralty law, the captain of a ship was given full authority to use physical violence to manage his crew, passengers, and cargoes, including slaves. In common law jurisdictions, legal authorities described captains to be sovereigns of a small, uh, of a small government. 
the sea removed from the domains of national and imperial sovereignty and from legal institutions of justice demanded violence to maintain legal order. Racial violence aboard the ship was justified through threats of mutiny, one of the moments at which slaves became legal persons. The authority and efficiency of admiralty law in the case of ships and slaves depended on its ability to transgress the personhood property divide that informed the ship and the slave in different ways. So now that I've sketched some of the connections between the slave and the ship as legal person, let me now return to the voyage of the Komagatmaru and its 1914 Middle Passage. And I should say that the term Middle Passage is one that's used almost exclusively in terms of transatlantic slavery. To be clear, I'm using it here as a way of referencing the Komagatamaru's voyage at sea and to highlight the echoes of slavery and its trans-Pacific journey. In July 1913, after owning the Sicilia for just over two decades, the Hamburg America line sold the vessel to a small Japanese firm. He owned one ship already, the Genzin Maru No. 3. Its newest acquisition would double their fleet, expand the company's trade routes, and increase their profits. Their two ships crisscrossed the South China Sea, carrying Japanese coal to Asian ports of call, including Manila and Java. By the spring of 1914, the firm began pursuing the possibility of transporting other cargoes, including Chinese indentured labor. A Kobe shipping broker, uh, they sent a Kobe sh shipping broker to Hong Kong where he was to obtain a passenger license for the China coast coolie trade. And it was in Hong Kong that the firm's broker, Mr. Odagiri, would have a chance to would have a chance encounter with Gurdit Singh, who had been looking to charter a vessel and had been unsuccessful. In their meeting, Singh expressed his interest in chartering a ship to transport Punjabi migrants to Vancouver. The owners seemed intrigued by his proposal. Leasing the Komagatmaru to a Punjabi merchant seemed like a rewarding financial undertaking that held potentially fewer risks than uh, transporting indentured Chinese laborers on Chinese passenger ships in accordance with increasingly restrictive British laws. But this would be a tremendous miscalculation. Over the next seven months, the Komagatmaru would be at the center of a series of legal controversies that drew the attention of imperial and colonial authorities in Hong Kong, Britain, India, and Canada. It also captured the interests of Indian anti-colonials across the globe. Although the ship never transported Chinese indentured labor, the Chinese China coast coolie trade remained vividly present in the 1914 voyage, a presence that also recalled histories of transatlantic slavery. In March 1914, the Komagatamaru's owners leased their ship to Gridit Singh for six calendar months. The charter party established the new laws of the ship, including the vessel's permissible sea routes and the division of authority aboard. The steamer was only to be employed in strictly neutral trades, could only land at certain ports of call. The charter party granted Gridit Singh a full range of powers that surpassed the authority of the ship's captain. Singh controlled the whole reach and birthren of the ship and held authority over the captain and crew, according to the charter. Originally from Sirali village in the Amritsar district of landlocked Punjab, where the Singh came to be known as Bengal Ka Captain or Captain of Bengal, a region from which he did not come. Singh's newfound power came with clear responsibilities. According to the charter party, he was accountable for all charges and expenses arising through taking steerage passengers and was to supply all provisions in every respect in accordance with the Hong Kong ordinances and to the satisfaction of the emigration officer. In return, the firm assured that the Komagatamaru would be granted a Hong Kong passenger certificate for a full complement of steerage passengers and would be fitted with necessary boats and rafts. As the ship awaited departure from Hong Kong, Singh consulted three lawyers and was advised that there were no restrictions upon the immigration by Indians from the colony unless they are under contract of service. As the passengers were farmers and not indentured laborers, the prohibitions did not apply to them. And you can see here on the manifest that uh, all of the passengers were on this particular page were listed as farmers and that uh, is the case for the ship manifest more generally. But the ship's departure was delayed in Hong Kong on account of the passenger's license. 
Following the ship's eventual departure, there was no further discussion of the passenger permit, but there was a considerable uh, amount of controversy over the tickets that Gurdjit Singh issued to his passengers. So these white tickets pictured here authorized the landing of indentured Chinese workers and not free Indians. And these are the passengers, or these are the tickets that Gurdjit Singh issued to the passengers. When their broker in Hong Kong, uh, when their broker was in Hong Kong, the firms, uh, the firm successfully secured a Chinese indenture permit under the Chinese Immigration Ordinance of 1889. Under the act, a passenger ship included every ship carrying from port in Hong Kong and every British ship carrying from port in China or within 100 miles of the coast thereof, more than 20 passengers being native of Asia. Here, Asia did not include India. The ordinance outlined in minute details the regulations that were to be absor uh, observed by captains of vessels, transporting contract and free labor from Hong Kong and China. It established the requisite minimum standards to ensure the well-being of Chinese women, men, uh, Chinese women and men, and the seaworthiness of the ships that transported them. Chinese passenger ships and those aboard were to be properly cared for, or captains would be subject to penalty, including imprisonment. The Hong Kong Ordinance made no specific reference to transatlantic slavery, yet the slave and the slave ship hovered throughout. Like many laws surrounding indenture, the ordinance was a legal and political response to transatlantic slavery. Following abolition, British authorities proposed indenture to be a new form of labor, supposedly based on consent, free will, and contract. The ordinance foregrounded the legitimacy of consent through its repeated references to contract passengers as opposed to indentured laborers. The message of the Hong Kong ordinance was that indenture was not slavery. On Chinese emigrant ships, ship decks were inspected for proper ventilation, shipmasters were required to hire doctors, and all vessels were to be fully operational with sufficient food and water. Ships without licenses and those without proper uh, or and those with prohibited fittings could be searched and detained. Notwithstanding efforts to distinguish indenture from slavery through law, consent, and freedom, Indian and Chinese uh, indentures and the ships on which they traveled formed an indelible mark on the British Empire. Through the architecture of ships, their names, common sea routes and conditions, including high rates of death and disease, indenture was a continued reminder of transatlantic slavery, particularly the horrors of the Middle Passage. On the outbound journey from Hong Kong, Gurdjit Singh issued each passenger two tickets, so this white ticket here and also a blue one. The white ones were issued under the eighth schedule of the Hong Kong ordinance and were intended for the use of transporting indentured uh, Chinese emigrants to Vancouver. The blue permits were class passenger tickets administered by the Gurunanak Steamer Company, a company that was started by Gurdjit Singh. According to Indian authorities, Singh administered these tickets solely to defraud passengers. He convinced them that these passes were issued by the government, that they authorized each recipient to enter Canada. But Singh did not speak or read English, neither did most of the passengers. As such, many who received the white tickets wholeheartedly uh, believed that they would be permitted to land upon arrival. We were given pass passes by government under the signature and we went, Rala Singh told authorities following the ship's arrival in Calcutta. The white tickets, which authorized the transport of Chinese contract passengers, were marked with the names of Indian travelers. And here we see the name of Surgeon Singh, uh, and he was one of the 59 passengers who boarded the special train to Punjab before the Budge Budge massacre. By issuing white vouchers to the, China, to the Komagatamu passengers, Gurdjit Singh inadvertently transformed free Indian farmers into indentured and unfree Chinese. In so doing, he knowingly or unknowingly problematized the freedom unfreedom distinction that figured so prominently in the abolition of slavery, in debates on indenture, and in conceptions of free migration. As the ship's voyage would make clear, and as Gurdjit Singh would write in his memoirs several years later, Indians were not free. On the subcontinent, they remained firmly under British control. In the colonies and dominions, they were subject to coercive legislation that denied them the mobility promised to British subjects. Immigration laws Gurdjit Singh charged were standing monuments to the selfishness and color prejudice 
of Britain and her dominions. The racial inhumanity of British law, he continued, had long been established through transatlantic slavery. It set the repressive foundations for indenture and directly informed immigration prohibitions. By issuing Chinese contract tickets to free Indians, Singh was tracing a continuous line between slavery, indenture, and free migration, characterizing them as contemporaneous forms of racial legal violence that united Britain's empire across time and space. In drawing these connections, I argue in the book more fully in the fifth chapter, where that Singh challenged the linear chronology of British legality and history. Slavery, scholars have argued, established the financial forum structures and institutions that were central to Atlantic economies. Financial instruments, including bills of exchange, interest-bearing certificates, and maritime insurance facilitated the transfer of capital and commodities over long distances while connecting disparate parts of the British Empire. Bills of exchange worked as new forms of paper currency, enabling merchants to pursue goods for trade in West Africa, to, to secure slaves and to export plantation commodities to Europe. But transatlantic systems of credit were always already racial. Credit was embedded in what Ian uh, Baucom calls a double economy, an economy of monetary value and an economy of trust to which character was crucial. Bills of exchange enabled European men to lend money to other European men so they could purchase African captives and plantation commodities. Of course, Gwydit Singh was not a Liverpool or London merchant. In the eyes of British, Canadian, and Indian authorities, he was an audacious colonial subject. The financial worlds that were foundational to thriving maritime economies were off limits to him. A system of credit, Baucom reminds us, was more than just a set of accounting protocols. It demanded a phenomenology of transactions, promises, character, credibility that did not extend beyond Europe and certainly not to an Indian populace thought to be mendacious. Gurdjieff Singh was outlawed from the world of global capital, thought, uh, so banks in Shanghai were closed so that passengers and supporters could not withdraw any money. Potential investors were threatened with imprisonment, but this didn't stop him. Well versed and experienced in the art of commerce, Gurdjieff Singh assembled his own maritime economies um, that drew on bills of exchange and interest-bearing certificates, and by which he established shipboard systems of credit, debt, and financial exchange. So this is uh, um, his promise to pay 24% uh, interest on the monies that he borrowed. Gurdjieff Singh encountered many financial difficulties in chartering the Kamagata Maru, and he borrowed money from at least 94 passengers while they were docked in Moji. To document these transactions, he drew up an agreement signed by certain passengers, and the agreement uh, reads as follows. The sum of money which we deposited on the 29th of April, 1914, for the purpose of defraying occasional expense incurred for necessary requirements and upkeep of the vessel, and the interest of which sum was to be paid to us 24%, will be recovered by us from the Khalsa Diwan Society of Vancouver, who are trying their best for our welfare. In the event that the Khalsa Diwan Society was unable to pay the loans, uh, passengers could recover their money from Bhai Gurdjieff Singh. However, passengers could not request their deposits as long as he was on the vessel. So it was only once Gurdjieff Singh successfully uh, disembarked that passengers could then uh, try to get their money back. Money would be paid only when the ship reached shore. The format of the agreement is as significant as its content. So Singh wrote his agreement signed by certain passengers on summary of freight lists where he enumerated the names, villages, and districts of passengers followed by signatures and thumb impressions. By listing passengers on summary of freight lists, Singh, Singh kept accounts of money lent and money owned, but he also gestured to the destitution and despair of passengers aboard the ship. At the top of the page uh, is a, at the top of page one is a scribbled note, and it reads, uh, it's addressed, sorry, it's addressed to the priest of Vancouver's Khalsa Devon Society, it's written quickly and urgently in fragmented and disjointed prose. And it says, please help us get off the ship. We are ready to do service for you. Please don't let us be sent back. Until we are able to pay you back, we will be at your mercy. 
Writing with urgency and desperation under the imminent threat of deportation, Gordit Singh pointed to the connected histories of slavery, indenture, and so-called free migration, points he would more fully develop in his memoirs published in 1928. But echoes of transatlantic slavery also reverberated in passenger appeals. The captain has refused to give us any lights, wrote Amir Muhammad Khan, a Muslim and one of Gurdjit Singh's closest associates on the ship and a member of the, um, a member of the uh, provisions committee. 370 passengers are confined in a dark prison ho house at night. We are treated very badly. We are treated as mere chattel. The conditions were deplorable and other passenger claim. Lights have been turned off decks not washed, water stopped, steam for cooking, food stopped, seawater put into our provisions, sickness prevails, no doctor. The authorities have made us beggars, slaves, close prisoners in solitary confinement for an indefinite period in a steamship. As Daljit Singh, where the Singh secretary described it, the Ferengis treated us as inanimate objects which did not want food or water. And Ferengi is of course, uh, an Arabic term for foreigner and used disparagingly to describe uh, white Britons and other Europeans. By tracing connections between slavery, indenture, and Indian migration, Gurd Singh argued that the fate of those confi confined to the Kamagatamaru was tied to the inhumane conditions that were established through Britain's transatlantic slave trade. He and several passengers marshaled slavery and the languages of abolition um, as a way of critiquing and condemning their own imprisonment. So let me very quickly conclude. Situating the Kamagatamu in maritime worlds as I seek to do in Across Oceans of Law presents a different history of the ship and its voyage. One that exceeds the conventional themes of arrival, departure, nationalism and ter territory. Foregrounding the Kamagatamu as a legal form uh, and the ship as a legal form and turning to the documents of maritime economies points to continuities of racial, legal, and colonial violence across history, geography, uh, continuities that are not always evident when we think of historical events in terms of divided regions, uh, continents, or periodizations. Moreover, following the ship's multiple voyages across the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic uh, oceans as it carried Europeans and Punjabis and as it transported cargo including cattle, coal, and later opium, the movements of the Stupenhook, Sicilia, and Komagatamaru suggest that imperial and colonial histories are not linear, chronological, or sequential, but are shared and overlapping. Histories of transatlantic slavery were not remnants of the past. They, re they formed a recurring presence through the legal personhood of the ship in the maritime finance uh, of shipboard routines and in the language of critique that Gurdjit Singh and his comrades used in their efforts to challenge the inhumanity of British imperial rule. Thank you.